<laughs> We're uh, glad to have with us back at the Phoenixville Public Library tonight Mark DeWitt Lanyon, local author, who we had here last June in connection with his book on the Underground Railroad in Chester County. Um, since retiring from a career in behavioral health, Mark has been uh, doing a lot of research on Chester County history and has produced his latest tome on Chester County's forgotten history called Lost Chester County, Pennsylvania. Mark is here tonight to tell us more about his book and share some uh, photos too and he'll be answering your questions after his presentation so please hold all your questions until the end. That's for the folks on Zoom and in person. So with that, Mark, welcome. Take it away. All right. Hey. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Nice turnout for this evening. And uh, how this book came about was while I was doing presentations on my first book called Abolition and the Underground Railroad in Chester County, afterwards people would come up and they would say, I never knew anything about the John and Hannah Cox house. I never knew what Long with Progressive Friends meeting was all about. You know, and they would say, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. So I said to myself, what other things don't people know about? So I started thinking about that, started doing a little bit of research, and uh, so that's how it, it came about. And so what I started doing, for example, I went to uh, the Phoenixville, is it the Phoenixville area? Historical Association. Historical yeah. Society of the Phoenixville area. Oh, right. Yeah. So I went in there and I just said, look, I'm, I'm looking into writing a book about what I'm calling the unknown, little known, and forgotten history of Chester County. What things would you put in a book? And the first thing was the Griffin Cannon. And the second thing was the uh, uh, Mojelica, especially like the, 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 the kitty cup, you know, the kitty teacup. And so I thought, okay. So I went to like the Oxford area, Chester County Historical Society, asking them, what would you want in your book? What things do you think people may not know about, but could know about? So that's how that came about. And that's how I learned about the Griffin Cannon, the Oxford Carmel Factory, uh, the Chester County Poor House. And this book is meant to be a comprehensive history of Chester County. And just like with my book on the abolitions movement, People were like, well, you didn't write about this, and you didn't write about that. And I said, well, if I were to do that, it would be a 10-volume set. And for right now, we just have one volume. Same thing with this. So as I said, I'm calling it the unknown, little-known, and forgotten history of Chester County. And in talking with people, somebody said, oh, I knew that. I said, well, good. You get a gold star for that. That's great. <laughs> so uh, what I did, I broke the book into nine chapters. And under each chapter, there's different topics. What's neat about this book, you can pick it up and go, mm, no, I think today I'll look at this. And you can flip through it and read different pieces. So the, the first chapter is about the Native Americans in Chester County. And I'm sure most of you know who would you consider the most famous Native American in Chester County. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Lenape? Well, the Lenape, Lenape Indians, but how about a specific what? Can you think? Oh, I don't know. Indian Hannah. Indian Hannah. Very good. Uh, Indian Hannah. She's probably the most, the best known Native American in Chester County. And uh, she was born to, to uh, Indian parents in 1730. She lived in a cabin on the Webb uh, property, which he was a Quaker. And you know where 52 used to go? Well, it no longer goes, but that's where they had a marker for her. But then when they closed down, they moved that marker over by the uh, Longwood Progressive Friends Meeting House. So, let's, hopefully this works. Use the arrow. Oh, okay. Yep, that worked. Well, now it, it, it was bad at me. The, the little arrow didn't work. Uh. But anyway, it says, the last of the Indians in Chester County was born to the Vale about 300 yards to the east of the land of the protector of her people, the Quaker Civilman William Webb. So, now that isn't really accurate because they moved it over to, but that gives you a feel for what it is. So she never married. She had a small farm. She made her living by weaving baskets, making brooms, and uh, when she could no longer maintain her farm, she started living with different Quaker families. She was kind of like the, she, she would help around the house. And, but as her health declined and her ability to earn a living, 
uh, she was declared a charity case. And in 1797, she was declared legally indigent, and she was moved into the Chester County Poorhouse, which I'll talk about a little bit later. That was 1800. Two years later, she passed away, which unfortunately a lot of times happens. You get pulled out of what you're familiar with. And so, but she was once asked, uh, what was your adult life like? And she said, I was a migrant domestic worker. So within Longwood Gardens, there's a memorial cross to Indian Ham. And uh, it's, it's still there. During the Victorian times, it was very common to have a memorial marker or a headstone. Not necessarily the grave wasn't there, but you wanted to memorialize someone. So George Washington Pierce, who was the great, great grandson of the first owner of the property was the one that started that. And Longwood Gardens still does that to this day. So, Oakey Hawking Preserve, if you're on, is it Route 3? I think. No. Um, that they were part of the Lynn Island Abai tribe. And uh, upon arriving in the colonies, William Penn told the people, you're not allowed to take Indian land unless two things happen. One, you buy it, or two, the Indians abandon the property, in which case it's up for grabs. And so what happened was Oki Hawkins were very concerned because there were more and more colonists coming in, and they wanted to protect their land. So they met with William Penn and the Provincial uh, Council in 1701. And they made a request for a permanent land that was granted to them. William Penn sold them 500 acres of land. And once it was approved, now, you know, on the one hand, it sounds like a great thing. On the other hand, it wasn't so great because once uh, the colonists knew, okay, now we know where the boundary is. Because prior to that, they were concerned that they'd be encroaching on their land, so they'd stay like you know, five miles away. Once they knew, okay, here's the boundary. They were building their homes like right up to the boundary. It's just like, remind us when our two girls were little, we were on the way to Florida in the car, and like, and they'd be like, both daughters were like, and like, I'm not touching her, I'm not touching her, like this far apart. <laughs> so that's what they were doing. Like, we're not on their land. And so they got really upset with that, so finally said, forget it, and they moved out west. So the land was considered abandoned and it was taken over by other people. So there's, you may have seen the sign. You know. And so today, there's still 155 acres. They've turned it into a preserve. There's walking trails and whatnot. But that's the 155 acres. That's what's left of the original 500. So uh, Pennsylvania, even though it was once the center of Lenape life, it's one of the few states that does not have a reservation, nor does it acknowledge any native tribe. There's no Pennsylvania College or University courses focusing on Native American studies. And the Pennsylvania Department of Education said, mandates that students in, in high school learn about Native Americans. Sadly, a review was done of 10 different history books that are used in high schools. And there was only one sentence about the Lenape Indians in the textbooks. So that kind of shows Pennsylvania things about Native Americans. Um, Nottingham Park. How many people have been to Nottingham Park? Okay. And how many people have been to Hearst Potato Chips? All right. That's <laughs> on the way to Nottingham Park. You go meander around, through, especially when they have the Christmas lights up, and you meander, meander through. The, and then you go straight to the employee parking lot, left to the visitor center, right to about two miles down is Nottingham Park. And there it is, Nottingham County Park. And most people know that about it. Hey, it's a fun place to go. They have horse, you can take your horse and go horseback riding. You can play baseball. There's a lot of picnic areas to go. But how many people know what other thing Nottingham Park is well, not well known for, but has? Well, how about, it's in Westchester, you drive around, and what do you see? Green buildings? That's serpentine stone, or serpentine stone, depending on how you want to say it. 
Nottingham Park is one of the only three places in the United States where serpentine stone was mined. So, so the Nottingham Presbyterian Church, that was built, I'm trying to take a picture, but it didn't really, and I took a picture, it didn't come out, it didn't really show the green real well, so I figured, yeah, we'll just use our imagination. But um, Nottingham Park was built from the serpentine stone, which is mined right there. <coughs> and the, not, the National Park Service declared Nottingham Park serpentine barrens as an official national natural landmark in 2009. And there's a close-up of it. So within the, the National Nottingham Park serpentine barrens, there were both serpentine and feldspar quarries, but there was also chromite ore mines. And that's not too exciting, but that's where the mine used to be, and of course it flooded. But what, before 1865, all the chromite ore in the United States came from here. In 1850, the serpentine barrens of Nottingham were the largest source of chromite in the world. So, the Nottingham, it was also used to manufacture paint pigment. And the Nottingham chromite ore was shipped uh, over to Liverpool, England, where it was also used in the textile industry because prior to that, natural dyes faded very quickly. But for some reason, adding chromite to the dye, the, the dye held. I don't know why. But Andreas Kurtz moved to England in 1822 and began selling chromite to the uh, textile industry. But then other people started doing it. And he's like, well, I want to make money. So he started playing around with coming up with different color paints. One of the colors he came up with was called Kurtz, K-U-R-T-Z, yellow. Well, Prince Charlotte, who was the daughter of King George IV, loved that color. So she ended up painting all of her carriages yellow. And that was the inspiration for all the yellow taxi cabs in New York City and all the yellow school buses that you see driving around here. So that's something we're, you know, because of us. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So chapter three talks about villages and buildings. And mind you, I'm not going to cover in each chapter, but I'm going to take a few highlights. But in West Grove, that's where my wife and I live, West Grove, Pennsylvania, there used to be, it was called the, the Paxson and Comfort casket factory and it was known for their high-end caskets but during the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic uh, there was a huge demand for caskets because unfortunately so many people were passing away so they scrapped doing all the high-end and they started manufacturing just pine caskets 24 7 trucks were lined up to get caskets and take them distribute them all over the place so uh, once that was over they reintroduced their high-end caskets, and they were there until it burned down in 1929. And that's literally just, just down the hill from where we live. Then, this was the Chester County Poor House. And uh, it was a beautiful three-story brick house of 350 acres. It was one of the first poor houses that actually treated their residents with dignity and respect. They had uh, fresh spring water, a well-equipped kitchen, and uh, central heat. And, but over the years, it, it, it changed. It went from a poorhouse to an orphanage, to a homeless shelter, to a battered women's refuge, a nursing home, an insane asylum. A lot of people, it's near Emeryville, so you might have heard of the Emeryville of insane asylum. And then it became a state police barracks. So uh, after that, the whole thing was torn down and now they have high-end condos there. So. And then there's a town, this is Lincoln University. Um, that's the historic marker for Lincoln. But does anyone know what Lincoln University is built upon? I know ground, but it was, it's built upon the town of Hensonville. Hensonville uh, was named after its first permanent resident. Emory Henson, and it was a free black community. 
So Hensonville or Lincoln University is only six miles from the Mason-Dixon line. You come up from Oxford, and there it is. So what happened was uh, there were two brothers, Thomas Henry Amos and James Ralston Amos, and they were Jake Ralston or James Ralston was an itinerant minister, and he wanted to learn more about the Bible and theology. So he swung four miles one way to Oxford to meet with uh, Reverend John Miller Dickey at the Oxford Presbyterian Church. And he was for an hour, then he walked four miles back. So he kept doing this. And finally, James Ralston, uh, Reverend Dickey got busier and busier. And he said, you know what? I can't do this anymore. Why don't we set up an institution? So that was where they built Ashman Institute, which then became Lincoln University. And so Hensonville uh, was, you had free blacks, you had freedom-seeking blacks, and you had free blacks living there. And this was like a place where people could come, they could grow their own food, no one took it from them, you know, what the, the labor, the, what they worked for, they could keep, they weren't working for somebody else and having it all stolen from them. And the other thing is, freedom seekers would come, and they, on the way, because in a minute we'll talk about Hosanna's Church, and that's where freedom seekers would come, and they really liked what they saw, and they were given a change of clothes, and they were just assimilated into the community. So the other thing about Hansonville, uh, the, anyone know about the 54th Massachusetts Infantry? It was a, a black infantry, and 18 members of the Hensonville community volunteered because prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, you were not allowed to be a soldier because they didn't trust you with a gun. You could be a cook or you could take a stable hand. But once the Emancipation Proclamation was, became law, uh, Lincoln specifically said African Americans be allowed to be soldiers. They all volunteered. There was a fight down in South Carolina, and they uh, charged the Confederates, the commander was killed, others were killed, and anyone ever seen the movie Glory? That's what that's based on. So 18 of those people of the 54th came from Hessenville. So what happened was, as Lincoln University started growing, <coughs> they needed land. So they started buying up the land in Hensonville. So unlike other towns, like you, you see towns like out in the west where they're abandoned and they're, they're a ghost town, Hensonville basically just disappeared. There, it was there for about 40 years, and then as Lincoln started buying it up, it was all done legally. I mean, they bought them, they didn't steal the land, they bought it. So what was kind of crazy is in the beginning, here you had the community helping build Lincoln University. So it's kind of like, on the one hand, hey, this is really great, we're helping to build, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, now we're losing our community to Lincoln. But, and so what happened with Lincoln is it started off as a missionary school. They wanted to train missionaries to go over to Africa, which they did. But once the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, you had roughly four million illiterate uh, free enslaved people. So that's when Reverend Dickey said, wait a minute, we don't, we can't bring all four million people here to teach them how to read and write. Let's train teachers here and send them out to train people. So that's why it quickly changed from a missionary school to an education school. And that's what they did. Now, schools, like all were different schools and uh, New London Academy, that's in New London, Pennsylvania. That was founded by Reverend Allison in uh, 1743. It was the first public school in the colony of Pennsylvania. And shortly after 1752, Alexander McDowell, who succeeded Reverend Allison, moved the academy to Newark, Delaware. And you might recognize that building or not. It's right across from what used to be the Irish pub on the main street. but. Uh, so that became the Newark Academy building, and that grew into Delaware College, which then grew into the University of Delaware. So what happened was the building that was New London Academy became the local high school. And then once Avon Grove built their own high school, that closed down. And now it's just a uh, administration 
building. And then up front, there's a uh, stone commemorating that. So there were a number of students, a number of students graduated from New London. They went on to become senators, congressmen, but three of the graduates were signers of the Declaration of Independence. You had George Reed, James Smith, Thomas McCain. And these three men, uh, talking with a friend of mine, he who's in politics, he said he firmly believes if it wasn't for New London Academy, America as we know it would not exist because so many went on to become generals and, and uh, senators and governors, and they produced so many that, that helped the, the founding of this country. So the other, um, another school, the Soldiers Orphan School, and the Soldiers Orphan School system began with the election of Andrew Gray Curtin for governor of Pennsylvania in 1861. One day he opened, it was knocking on the door, he opened the door, there were these two little kids, they're orphans of the Civil War, begging for food. And he said, this is totally wrong. I mean, we shouldn't have little children running around begging for food. So he went to the legislator, legislature and said, can we do something? And so then when uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Company heard what was going on, they donated $50,000, which I guess if you do the math, then probably a couple of million or more in today's money. So they established the Soldiers Orphan School and it became the Chester Springs Soldiers Orphan School and Literary Institute. And by 1870, there were 213 students, 141 boys, 72 girls. And at Chester Springs, there's an informative um, talk about that. So the boys and girls, they wore uniforms. The girls uh, sewed their own like dresses. And the boys' uniforms, they were military style. And uh, they, they, they were made out of the leftover Civil War material for that. Now, what happened was, if a student passed away and there was nobody to claim the body, there was uh, the Vincent Baptist Meeting House. They donated land to the school to bury the, the, the children. So from 1875 until 1909, a total of 21 such students passed away and they're buried there. The average age was nine, the youngest one, one year of age, the oldest was 16. And there's the obelisk, and they're, they're buried around the obelisk. And then on each side, they have the names of the, the, the students and their birth and, and death. Now, Diamond Rock Octagonal School, um, not a lot of nods. Okay, y'all know about that, we'll skip that one. <laughs> um, this in the North Valley Hills of the... Tradition. That place. Yeah. And there's large boulders there with crystallized quartz. It's the only place in the world this is found. It's so hard, it's like a diamond, it can cut glass. And that's why it's called diamond rock, because it's, you know, it's like diamond type rock. And the Quakers and the Presbyterians believed in education. They thought that was really important. A uh, local fellow donated land for the school. They, they built it. It was octagonal. Does anyone know why it was octagonal? For the heat of the school. Well, one was you could fit more students in. The second was the teacher sitting in the middle could keep an eye on all the students. And also, the, the stove was in the middle, so the heat could radiate all around. And they had windows. There was a lot more natural light having all these different you know, eight sided. Now, um, so it, in 1813, the, the school opened up. And one funny story is the teacher was really impressed with how the older students were doing. And he said, Well, I'm introducing a new topic. He told them what the topic was. They went home, told their parents, This is what we're going to be learning. They freak out. They go to the school board. The school board's off. They call the teacher in, and they're like, you can't do this. You cannot uh, mix religion, sin, with politics, taxes. And that's no place in the school. Realizing he was losing, it was a losing battle, he decided, I'm not going to teach them syntax. <laughs> uh, it's a true story. <laughs> uh, 
that's what this that's what it looked like in 1905. The, 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 the roof was falling in, the windows were gone, the door was gone, it was just totally shot. But some former students and concerned citizens formed a group and they rallied together and by 1918 it was fully restored. And that just shows what can happen if, if concerned citizens come together rather than let it just fall apart and just tear it down and oh, we'll just build a, you know, some houses there. So today, that's what it looks like. And there's a historic plaque there for So I'm just really happy that that's what they were able to do, as opposed to you know, so many places just go to the wayside. It's just such a shame. Chapter 5 covers manufacturing. And most people know where Oxford is. Mm -hmm. Did you know Oxford had a caramel company? Mm -hmm. they, made, they made chocolates and caramels. Well, in 1882, William Parker, he operated a caramel factory in Philly, but it would cost a lot to run it from there because they melt, they had to bring the milk in and whatnot. So he looked around and decided on Oxford, so that's where he built his new um, factory. In the first six months of business, they produced 550 tons of candy and used 200,000 gallons of milk. And that's what it looked like. And they were going on. And their product was shipped all around the world. And for 41 years, they produced um, caramels and different you know, confectionery products. And what was really neat, they hired a lot of girls and women to work in the factory. You know, and they paid them good wages for that. Now, Griffin Canada. You all know what the Griffin Canada is. I'm sure you've all gone to the, the park up here. And it's enclosed in, I don't know if it's glass or plexiglass, but that, that's one of the Griffin Canons because Phoenix Iron Company, they're well known for making girders and, and materials for skyscrapers, bridges, uh, railroads, but they were less known about that piece of equipment. It was known as a three inch ordnance rifle model 1861, better known as the Griffin Cannon or uh, Griffin Gun. And it was used more than any other a weapon in the Civil War. And it was more accurate because it was like a rifle, it had a bore. It was, it was lighter too, so um, they could, the people towing that behind the horse, or the horse hauling it, could keep up with the infantry, whereas the other ones, it went from 900 pounds to 600 pounds. And there's a historic marker, and it talks about the Griffin gun, 1861, and the Phoenix column. So, July 1st, 1863, Griffin Cannon, under the direction of General John Buford, fired the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg. And um, if you tour the Gettysburg battlefields, you see approximately 75 Griffin Cannons spread throughout the battlefield. So, and there it is. So, Colonial Springs Bottling Plant. Probably most of you don't know about that. It's located near Valley Forge, and uh, Benjamin Franklin Fisher was an officer in the Civil War. He purchased a tract of land which contained Colonial Springs, and he went into for a business arrangement. They started bottling the water and shipping it out for a fee, or people could come and just uh, fill up their own bottles with the water. So from 1908 to 1930, it was in business, and then it was eventually sold to the National Park Service. You can visit the plant. Like, when I went to take pictures, I didn't know exactly where it was, but I saw this little stream, and I'm following this little stream, and I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. So, there's the outside of the bottom plant. There's the inside. That's the entrance to the spring, and you can see the water coming out. And then inside, that's the actual spring. So the spring is still running to this day, even though they're no longer bottling the water, which I think if the National Park Service wanted to be enterprising, they just start bottling the water itself. That's just me. Um, chapter six goes over entertainment and recreation. Now, how many people here, probably most of you, have heard of Sunset Park? <coughs> okay. That's close to where we live. It was the height of the Depression. Money was tight. Roy Waldman, a dairy farmer, 
kind of sounds like uh, Woodstock. Mm -hmm. Here's the dairy farmer. But he lived near West Grove. He knew a lot of people were coming from the south to try to find jobs. And they weren't interested in the music that was the northern style of music. So boy thought, you know what? I can get a little extra income. So he hired some Amish. They built an open air uh, stage. Seating consist consisted of planks on cinder blocks. And uh, they hosted many country stars and who drove 750 miles up from Nashville. They included like Ray Acuff, Ernest Tubb, Patsy Cline, Loretta Lynn, George Jones, Johnny Cash, Dolly Parton, Tex Ritter, the Carter family, Hank Williams, Hank Williams Jr. And outside of the Grand Old Opry, Sunset Park was the premier place for country music. And Roy Walt, then the uh, founder of Sunset Park, he was known as Uncle Roy. He's here with a group of people that were called the Ridge Runners. So people came from far and wide, and one such person was a 21-year-old banjo player who got in his uh, 1961 Corvair, drove cross-country to come to here Sunset Park. Do you want to guess who that person was? Jerry Garcia. So he came, and upon arriving, he spent a lot of time meeting with the different artists and talking to them, talking about country music, bluegrass music. One person he met was David Grisman, who played the mandolin, and on their on one album called uh, American Beauty, he plays the mandolin on that, that uh, record. So I think it's an understatement to say Sunset Park influenced the music of Jerry Garcia. How much influence did Sunset Park have on the music scene? Well, in June of 2017, Rolling Stone listed the top 100 greatest country music stars. The first five in order were Merle Haggard, Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, Loretta Lynn, and the Carter family. All of them had played numerous times at Sunset Park. And here's the historic marker for Sunset Park. Also, under it was entertainment, Good News Productions, and um, over in Chester Springs or Yellow Springs, people call it different thing. Uh, Shorty Yeaworth, mm -hmm. he was the son of a Presbyterian minister. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't want to become a pastor. He believed his calling was to make films. So in 1952, Shorty purchased the whole shebang and set up Good News Productions, which ran from 1952 to 1973. And there's a uh, informational plaque about Good News Productions. Over 400 films were made. He produced numerous TV shows. He was a major producer for Billy Graham for his films. But um, he said, well, I just want a blockbuster film. So uh, his creative mind, they came across this gooey material produced by Union Carbide. And they said, what can we do with this? So they came up with the movie that you all know, The Blob. And so all the scenes for The Blob were filmed at Chester Spring, except two. One, Colonial uh, Theater, where the run-out scene, and the other was the, the Downing Town Diner. The rest of the scenes were all filmed there. And once complete, it was sold to Paramount Pictures and two actors and two songwriters got their start in this film. The first was Steve McQueen, and here Shorty Aworth is talking to Steve McQueen, helping him out. And the other, prior to being a well-known actress, the 11 or 12-year-old Patty Duke appeared in the 4D Man. And relatively unknown at the time, Burt Bacharach and Hal David, they were hired by Paramount to come up with a theme song for the blog. But then, unfortunately, due to financial difficulties, he had to sell the property. So, but um, my wife, at the time, one summer, she and her sister and mother were making lunches for all the people, all the all the actors and actresses and whatnot, doing that. So, tell me what happened. It was a film school for Penn State yeah. students, and we were doing all their food, and. Um, this head came through the window where we were passing out. And I remember the day, it was grilled cheese and tomato soup. 
And Steve McQueen stick his head in the window and he said, you got any extra lunch in there? And I, I was like, that's Steve McQueen. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave him a grocery so she sandwich the and a made soup. The soup. <laughs> <laughs> but he had been in Philadelphia and he was stopping out to see Shorty. But it was a, they were running a film school, a six week film school for Penn State, a film class for Penn State. Mm -hmm. That's now, have most of you been to Longwood Gardens? Yes. yes. Okay. When you you come off, I don't it doesn't matter which way, and you see this like three-story white building before you get into Longwood Gardens. Do you know what that is? It's Longwood Progressive Friends Meeting House, and uh, the Quakers believed in two sets of laws: God's laws and man-made laws. And their feeling was, if a man-made law was contrary to one of God's laws, they had to follow God's laws. And they believed all human beings were God's children. The conservative Quakers, because in 1776, the Quakers declared slavery. They said, if you own slaves, you can no longer be a Quaker, because it is no longer compatible. So the conservative Quakers said, OK, I no longer own slaves, or I never did own slaves. That's all I have to do. The progressive Quakers were, no, 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 no. We have to do more than that. You know, so that's why they got involved with the Underground Railroad. They got involved with the abolitionist movement. And some of the local Quakers did not approve of the worldly ways of the progressive Quakers, and they were tossed out of their meeting house. So uh, 1853, 58 men and women came together and decided to form their own meeting, and that's when that came into existence. So here's an older picture of the meeting house and numerous people down there. And it continued as a meeting house or as meeting until 1940, at which point Pierre DuPont purchased the building. And today it houses the um, Brandywine Valley Forest Info Center, and it's on the National Register of uh, Historic Centers, it's on the National Park Service Network of Freedom Sites, and it's a designated stop on the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad Highway. Now, one of the stories that came out of Longwood Progressive Friends meeting was six members of the went and met with President Lincoln. And they presented him with a petition. It was kind of like a document. It was basically was the beginnings of the Emancipation Proclamation. They said they met with him in June 20th, 1862, and they said, we believe all enslaved people should be set free. And he said, well, I will take that into consideration. June, July 22nd, he presented a rough draft of the Emancipation Proclamation to Congress. He, Lincoln issued the proclamation 7th, September 1862, and it went into effect January 1st, 1863. So again, that's something that you know, locally, that's how one of the things that we as local people, Southern Chester County, we have such a huge impact on the Emancipation Proclamation. And then you have Hosanna Church. If you are coming up out of Oxford, you go past Lincoln University, and right at the edge of their property is Hosanna Church. It's the only building left from Hensonville. And uh, what Hensonville residents did, they met in families' homes, but finally they said, you know what, we need our own place. So they raised the money, and it was one of the earliest black churches in Chester County. And their cemetery was one of the very first that put the names of deceased African Americans on the headstones. Because prior to that, they weren't allowed to do that. Hosanna Church was very active in the Underground Railroad. Because you figure, coming, Harriet Tubman used that as one of her stops. Because she had two main routes. One, she came up out of for Maryland and Virginia. She came right up uh, old route one. Old route one. Is that it? Yeah. I lived there. I've 30 years. I've left there. But, and they would stop there. And the other one was coming up 52. She would come up Route 52 with her people. And that's why Kenneth Square became known as the hub of the abolitionist movement. And also, it was like the main point for the, there were more underground railroad stations in the Kenneth Square area than anywhere else in, in the nation. So what would happen is, uh, there was freedom seekers would come up, either by themselves or a group of them, and they would come to the service, like what they saw, and they would assimilate. Now, what happened was, if you were an enslaved person, you were given Saturday afternoon 
to Sunday afternoon off. And they were just so generous. They needed all that time off. And so a lot of people like to come to the church service. Well, they had two services. The first one was very staid, informal, quiet. It was usually the slave catcher, the slave master sat in, they got bored, and he left. Then the second service started. And more, they had tambourines and clapping and singing and praising God. And so what at the end, if their slave master wasn't there, they would just go on a wagon and take off with somebody and, and start their journey on the Underground Railroad. No. As I said, Harriet Tubman, she was one of the ones, Frederick Douglass was there. They also used that as a meeting place to hold abolitionist meetings. And there's the uh, marker for the Hosanna Church. And the inside of the church, that's the way it looked back then. You know, the seats are the same, the pulpit's the same. Unfortunately, uh, when I was in there last year, there was a lot of water damage, the heating system is shot, and the, the uh, slate roof is shot. But fortunately, Lincoln just got a $150,000 grant to begin work on that building, which is possible, because it's such a historic building. So, Stargazer Stone. How many people here know about the Stargazer Stone? Okay, good. You want to come up? <laughs> <laughs> no? No. Stargazer Stone. How that came about? Well, William Penn and Ward Calvert. What happened was, a sea captain came to William Penn and said, you do know Philadelphia is in Maryland. He's like, heck no, this is our only port of camping. <laughs> so the, the Lord Cal, they started talking, bickering, and they hired local surveyors who they weren't happy with. So they uh, reached out to the London, the Royal Observatory of London, who sent over Jeremiah Dixon and Charles Mason to do the Mason-Dixon line. And uh, they, found they needed a place to do their social reading. They found it out at the Harlem Farm in Embryville. And what they did, they had like a quartz stone, they set their tripod over fancy equipment, and they could read the stars. Well, here come these local farmers going by, watching these two crazy Brits back and forth. Back. And finally they said, these guys are nuts. Look, they have a stone, they're looking at the stars. Let's call it the Stargazer Stone. So that's how it, it, it got its name. And uh, the Stonewall in 1908, the Harlem descendants deeded it over to the Chester County Historical Society and they built up the Stonewall around the protector. And close up of the plaque. Now, what really gave me chills when I was working on this book, first you had the Stargazer Stone, they're using the North Star. Well, when enslaved <coughs> people started moving up from the south you know, to get away from slavery, what were they told to do? Follow the North Star. So that was like, you know, fast forward 80 years or so. So had it not been for the Civil War, had it not been for enslaved people, this boundary would have just gone to the wayside. Nobody would have given it a second thought. But it became like the most famous boundary in the world because of that. You know, so it was Mason Dixon line. And, uh, I never knew anything about the Mason. I had heard the term Mason Dixon alive, and I just figured it just meant people that way eat grits and they have a funny accent. People mm -hmm. this way don't. But it's much, you know, it's so important. And that's the thing. So many people, matter of fact, a week from today, I'll be at Lincoln University. I graduated from Lincoln, but I'll be there. A friend of mine has a course. And she invited me to come present on the Underground Railroad, the founding of Lincoln University, because I was talking with Dr. Brenda Allen, who's the president of Lincoln, a while ago. And I said, I've got half the students here. I have no clue. She goes, no, 90 percent. Don't have a clue about what this area represents, what Lincoln represents, what the Mason-Dixon line represents, how important the Quakers were, what about the Underground Railroad, the abolitionist movement, all these things. So I want to go and present that. And one of the things I was telling the students is, when you walk around this campus, you are walking on sacred ground because Lincoln was built upon Hensonville, which was a free black community. And other free, freed blacks lived here, free blacks, freedom seeking blacks all lived here. And upon this land, Lincoln rose up from that. So, 
um, women's suffrage. You know, that's chapter eight. Anyone know about the justice bill? Great. Yeah, we all know about the grant. And I'm very glad it's back after it fell off the truck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> about that whole thing. The, well, the, um, the Quaker women who paid and had it made dragged it all over the place on a flatbed truck. Pretty yeah. primitive vehicle. Yeah. And they never damaged it. And then on the uh, anniversary of women's suffrage, <laughs> it was to go down to Philadelphia to be grown. And it never made it out of Valley Forge Park fell off the truck and it just came back I think a couple months ago yeah. and it cost a lot of money and it wasn't all covered by insurance. Wow. Well 63 years after the first women's rights convention was held in Westchester, uh, Catherine Wentworth Rauschenberger wanted to figure out a way to promote women's voting rights. So everyone knew about the Liberty Bell so she went to the same foundry that made the Liberty Bell and had the Justice Bell and she added to um, what was already on the bell. She said, establish justice, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. So she bought the flatbed truck and mounted it. The clapper was was um, chained so the bell couldn't ring. And this was done to emphasize the fact that women did not have a voice to be able to vote. And uh, she took it all over in 1915 went on a 5,000 mile tour of the 67 counties of Pennsylvania in order to promote it. Well, the vote failed, but Chester County was one of the very few counties that voted for the women's right to vote. It was good for them in Chester County. The 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote, was up for ratification in 1920. And again, the, the Justice Bell went on tour, and on August 18th, it was uh, ratified. And so, again, it was supposed to go in, ring 48 times for the 48 states. And it wound up in her backyard for, for years. And then upon her death, she moved it to the Washington Chapel. And then it sat back in a field yeah. for a long time. Mm -hmm. right. And then the, the, new, the, new, the new rector of the chapel said, what's that? And so now it's in a prominent place in the chapel, you know, where it should be. So war, the ninth chapter goes through wartime in Chester County. It goes through Civil War, Revolutionary, well, Revolutionary War, Civil War, uh, War of 1812, World War I, World War II. And Civil War, I talk about the drummer boy. And Charlie King, he was born April 4th, 1849, grew up in Westchester. He loved to drum, you know, drove his parents nuts because he was drumming on his bed, on the walls, on the table, whatever. And, the Civil War started when Charlie was only 12 years old, and he thought he was a pretty good drummer, so he asked his parents to allow him to enlist in the Union Army as drummer boy. At first, his father said no, but after the Union Army lost the battle of Fort Sumter, um, he said okay. So he joined, and a local grocer, uh, Captain Benjamin Sweeney, was the leader of the Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment. He said, look, he knew the family well. He said, I'll protect Charlie. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of him. So. He had three month enlistment because at the beginning of the Civil War, both sides thought this is just going to be a real quick war. You know, it'll be over in no time. You know, little do they know. But um, finally, um, he wanted to go back in because he did his three months, but he wanted to go back in. So finally, his parents consented and said, all right. So he went in and he was soon promoted to drum major. But then came the Battle of Antietam. And that was September 17, 1862, what is battle of the Civil War? Well, they weren't in close up to the battle because they were told to stay way back, which they did. But the Confederates began to shell the 49th, which he was a part of. A shell exploded, peace went into his lungs, and about a week later he died from infection. And um, he became, at age 13, the youngest Civil War casualty of the So. What happened was, no one knows where Charlie's buried. You know, his parents are buried in Greenwell Cemetery in Westchester. But a local Boy Scout, Brandon Lyon, heard the story of Charlie. He said, well, this is wrong. So he raised money to have a memorial set up, which is very close to where his parents are buried. And um, so, but 
at the Antietam Battlefield Visitors Center. Why? I don't know. His drum is there. Wait, they found his drum, but they couldn't find his body, but be that as it may. The other thing is uh, uh, Camp Elder, that was in Westchester. And what they did at the beginning of the Civil War, they had what was called parole camps, because there were so, so many people, soldiers were being captured, that Confederates didn't want to take care of the Union. The Union didn't want to take care of the Confederates. So like, why should we spend our money on them? We're fighting them. So they did the honor system. They said, okay, we captured 500 of you. So you go up to, back up to the Union country and go to a parole camp, you know, and you won't go back to fighting until we do some prisoner exchange. Well, that all sounded well and good, but it really didn't work out that well because the Confederates never did that. They just said, I go home, and if you disappear and wind up not fighting, we don't care. And so what happened was Camp Elder was opened up to receive Union soldiers, and it was established in July, and it only lasted a month, but they had to build all these. There was a lot of logistics, but what happened was there was 2,000 Union paid soldiers, but the federal government decided that the Confederate battlefield paroles issued to them were null and void, so they went back to fighting. And in September 2013, they came up with this uh, Civil War parole POW camp. And as I say, it was kind of a, a cool concept to be able to, to do that. But what the other thing that happened was the soldiers, Union soldiers who were assigned to watch them, they're like, heck no, they're, they're, they're our fellow soldiers. We're not going to keep them from escaping. That's ridiculous. So, it, the whole thing fell apart. So. The other was Camp Bloomfield in Kenneth Square. Uh, when you think of the War of 1812, you know, you think of, well, maybe Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, you know, all these, like, Kenneth Square? Really? Well, what happened was uh, the governor of Pennsylvania said, you know, we need to get ready in case of Philadelphia. So they called up all these troops, and one of the places that they were was in Kenneth Square, and that was, there's a, if you're coming out of Kenneth, there's the Country Butcher, which you may or may not know, it's a, it's a kind of a fancy store, and that, kind of talking about that, so what happened was, with, out of the War of 1812, you had this young company called DuPont, they produced all the gunpowder, you had the attack on Fort McHenry, out of which came the national anthem. And so this was just an overview of some of the things that are covered in the book. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you. And if you so desire, there's some books here. And if you'd like to purchase one, I'll be glad to sign it for you. And I forgot to say this when I was at, at um, East Town Library. They all thought I only took cash. I do take credit cards. And some people go, oh, I don't have any cash. And I'm like, oh, I can take a credit card. You could? Oh, I didn't know that. So anyways. But as I said, this, this book does go through some of the unknown, little known, and forgotten history of Chester County. And um, as I said, in the beginning, you can go through the table of contents, decide what you may or may not uh, write. And I'll just read you a quote that pertains to this book. He's a fellow Lincoln University graduate. He's an Oliver St. Clair Franklin. He's the uh, honorary British Consul for Greater Philadelphia. And he wrote, he said, I am blown away by the history. I had no idea about the Quakers or the immense activity of the Underground Railroad. Rather than lamenting the fact that Lincoln University is the only black college not surrounded by a large African American community, I can now give a better, more inclusive history as one community that supported freedom. And the narrative fits better for the first black college in the U.S. So, that's it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, let's open up the questions. Go ahead. Oh, I have a question. Are you actually have, have been uh, in contact with any of the public school in Chester County? Uh, just if, if kids can learn that part of history. The, the reason why I'm saying is that like our Chester County is amazing in terms of the history, but instead of 
bringing kids to Chester County or in Gettysburg, they take them to Williamsburg, which is artificial place. And I'm talking about Chester Springs. My kids graduated from Chester Springs Elementary in the five, in the fifth year, like last year. I've been arguing for years. I, uh, I couldn't convince um, the the um, the school that. We have such a history here that there's no need to take kids to artificial place, which is a Seattle, really, which is Williamsburg. Uh, we have it right here. We have Anselman Mill. We have Phoenixville. We have, you know, we have Westchester. We have Philadelphia. Everything, a Valley Forge, but but nothing is going on in terms of educating our children. And, and is there is anything that is going on? I mean, obviously, my kids are. 25 and 22 now, but... Uh, yeah, but every place they go or do a presentation, they're like, why aren't the schools learning this? Right, so well, that's why, yeah. like, say, why the school are not learning? I mean, it's like, we have a, such an amazing history here. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So, any other... There's a question from someone on Zoom, uh, wondering if you ever heard of a Wild West show that used to take place in or near Coatesville? Yes. And see, that's the thing is like, um, I started off with a very large table of color outline. And, but then, as I was doing research, if I could not find a lot of information, then I didn't write on it. So I knew about that, you know, which is it's a neat thing. But I found, for me, anyway, I found very limited uh, documentation. Also, did they, um, two part question, did they? Still mine at all down in Nottingham. And second question is the bottle company that you showed down in Valley Forge, is that the, right up against the scoop of river? The old bar I, uh, I was looking at the picture, it looked familiar like it was a spot where we would walk and it looked like that was right up no, against the river. No, it's not real close to the river though. Okay. No. Are they still mining down in Nottingham at no. all? No, the, the fill spars filled up with water, the chromite mines filled up with water. Uh, so, and as far as like, you can walk across the serpentine barrens, and they're called barrens because there's so many um, toxic minerals that not hardly any plant, there's a few plants that grow, and they're, they're found only there. You know, they're kind of like evolved into like these little plants, but they're all like low growing because and plus, the soil literally is hot from the from the uh, serpentine. Yes. Whereabouts in Valley Forge was that spring? Whereabouts? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Do you know where Washington's head? Yes. Headquarters. Mm -hmm. And and there's the railroad track. Mm -hmm. And you walk down. And there's Washington's headquarters. You walk a little bit further. There's stairs that go down. Okay. You walk up, cross over whatever road that is. And go up the trail about a mile, and that's where it is. Right, thank you. And actually, if you go to the visitor center and tell them, I want to go see the springs, they have a map of them. Okay. But what they don't tell you is there's three trails. So I'm like, well, one, I'm like, no, no, five got the third. And then by that time, I look, the sky is black. Mm -hmm. So from walking back, by the time I got back to my car, I had to take my shoes off and pour the water out. It was, it was just drenched. <laughs> Yes. I think that's the beginning of the horseshoe trail. Yeah. Right at the bottom, and then you start up the horseshoe trail. Okay. And it's up there. Was that uh, the Hires Root Beer Bottling Company at one time? Mm, no, that was on Main Street. No. Oh, that was yeah. down there. Yeah. No, and actually, in, in the book, it talks about G. What's his name? G. Retu, who was in, from Westchester. He was the one, he used to work at mushroom uh, laboratories. He was the one that was able to mass produce penicillin. But he worked for hires in Philadelphia prior, doing chemical research for them. But because of him, so many lives were saved. Because it was, and actually, Sir, was it Alexander Fleming? Yeah. He came over and visited him because he was the one that discovered penicillin, but he could not come up with a way to mass produce it. And he did because he said, well, it's a fungus. And I'm working with mushrooms, and it's a fungus, so he just kind of tweaked it and came up with mass produce. He actually, the way he did it, because they, when they're growing it, they couldn't separate the, the medium, whatever you call it, the host, from the 
It's a culture. It's called yeah, the culture. Right. So they, what, they, what he did, he got an old creamery, you know, the, 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 the thing that's to sep the cream separator. He put it in there and they spun it around, out came the penicillin. Um, <laughs> very creative. It, it's, it's somewhere in a museum, and I've seen it in a museum yeah. in the Kenneth Square. Is it like, I think it's University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary School yes. that has a museum there. Yeah. I was I was so sh surprised to see that. They have all these pictures of the first uh, uh, laboratory that was isolating uh, the culture of penicillin. Yeah, it's, and nobody's talking about it. We all know Fleming, right? It's like around the world. We, we don't know it's right here. It was done. Yeah. I had a friend in school who his parents owned a farm in Kimberton, and he said that they originally purified penicillin because through the sheep and extracted from the urine huh. in the sheep, and they used the sheep on their farm. Wow. wow. That I I didn't know that. No, I mean, it makes sense that the, it was it was a natural actor in working yeah, this. Right. That, that's uh, and the Russians were actually doing the same research almost at the same time. But the Fleming is uh, giving like the authority, well, the, yeah. basically the first. The library is going to be closing in a few minutes. I need to go to Zoom. Anyone on Zoom have a question and would like to unmute at this time? Yeah, me. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, two things is, first of all, uh, Mark, you mentioned Sunset Park. Where was that? That's in uh, Jennersville. If you were if you're coming up out of Hocasset and you come through Avondale, instead mm -hmm. of going on 41, you go straight and you go through West Grove and go a little bit further and where the Red Rose Inn is, it's right in that area there. Okay, okay. Uh, second thing is, uh, I hate to bust your bubble on this, but uh, the uh, the movie The Blob was filmed in several locations other than the uh, the uh, studios out there and uh, uh, down in town diner. In fact, you about 500 feet at that away from one of the locations, uh, directly across Main Street from the Griffin Gun Pavilion is a beautiful old Queen Anne's house sitting on the corner. Uh, it's known locally as the Saunders house because the Saunders uh, own it uh, now, but that was used as a doctor's office uh, in the uh, in the movie. Um, Dr. Stritz. Pardon? And there was a school too. Right. Barclays. Yeah, uh, the Barclays School, which is on 2nd Avenue, only about uh, two blocks away from the library, that was used as the high school scene where they uh, commandeered the the uh, uh, fire extinguishers for the movie, um, and there's another one uh, the just store. up. Pardon? The grocery store in Spring City. Yeah, well, Jerry's yeah, there was a, a scene in Spring City, um, but uh, uh, the uh, the uh, scene where the mechanics were working on a car, that was in uh, a, uh, a garage which was just recently torn down. Uh, at the uh, the uh, start uh, uh, or at seven on seven twenty four going west to Route twenty three mm -hmm. um, and uh, on twenty three I should say going up to seven twenty four. Uh, if you know where there's a, a new development there with several stores on a uh, mini mall uh, directly across the street on the corner there, uh, there's uh, a vacant lot uh, which. Uh, had been a, a garage here for many, many years, and that's where the uh, uh, mechanics uh, were, were uh, uh, filmed there in, in the uh, that part of the movie. That's but great. There, there are several other uh, uh, venues at uh, not just at uh, Goodwill, but at, uh, at uh, the uh, at, or the diner, but uh, right in town and around town. As the, Leading pointed out there was one in Spring City too. Great. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Any anyone else on Zoom with a question? We have to wrap up. Okay. Anybody else in the room? All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Please take advantage of uh, his books if you want to purchase them. Thank you all for coming and tuning in. Yes.